Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, uh, everybody. I, I'm really pleased to introduce you to uh, my friend, Amir Gilmore. Uh, I met Amir when he came to the College of Education in 2015 to study in um, the College of Education's Cultural Studies and Social Thought in Education program. Uh, Amir immediately impressed me, not only with his enthusiasm for his research, his willingness to get involved in student advocacy. Uh, he was involved in the Graduate and, and Professional Student Association. He was also involved in the Graduate Students uh, in Education group. Uh, more than that, I think Amir, uh, and this really came, it became apparent early, he's always drawn a really good balance in not only advocating for issues that, that are vital to our society, uh, but making himself available to people like me who may consider themselves an ally, but but severely lack um, experience, certain lived experiences and, and have uh, certainly a lot of uh, our own biases. Uh, I know I can go to Amir and ask him sincere questions without uh, any fear of reproach, and I appreciate that. Uh, I was not the only one who was impressed with him. So after uh, Amir became Dr. Gilmore uh, in 2019, he became an assistant uh, professor of, of our cultural studies and social thought in education program. And then uh, just this fall, he became an associate dean for equity and inclusion. And in, in that role, he works with student success and retention. Um, and now I, I got to read this because uh, I would never remember any of this. Uh, his interdisciplinary background in cultural studies, Africana studies and education allows him to traverse the boundaries across the social sciences, the arts and the humanities. His interest in black critical theory and black masculinities ground his scholarship on something called black boy joy. And he is well versed in areas such as critical race theory, feminisms and social theory. His vision and scholarship make critical contributions to the fields of black studies and education, as well as connect to larger discussions of Afro futurism and black aesthetics. Folks, my friend Amir Gilmore. Um, thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, so it's been since 2015 and I'm like, these, these, these years are catching up on me, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's hard for me to say even 2022, I'm like, doesn't roll off the tongue as easy as 2021. Um, but I am really thankful and honored to be in this space. And uh, I know I can, I'm a professor and I can yak a lot and talk a lot. So I kind of want to get through the, the presentation. So I think we can kind of open up to have conversation and um, I guess, you know, see where all, all this goes. And so I will uh, share my screen and we will just jump into this. I do apologize that if you hear some loud noises in my house, it's because I have a puppy and she's always the most obnoxious when I'm on a Zoom call. So I do apologize. So please bear with me. I have a very vocal um, husky. It's <laughs> new to our house. She's almost two years old and she, she actually talks. She doesn't bark, she talks. <laughs> um, and so can everyone see this okay? I just wanna make sure. Uh, does anyone need any closed captioning or anything of that nature or are we okay? I don't know how to do closed captioning, so I can't help with that, um, but I think we're okay. Okay. Do you know um, how to do it? Oh, look at that. You've got yeah, it right there. Through, through PowerPoint. It's not the best. And so, uh, you know, again, bear with me, it's Microsoft, but I'm just trying my best to be accessible as possible. Um, and so obviously, you know, this is the, the I'm, I'm here in the space and the challenges of DEI and how, you know, how can we help? Um, and so we will be going through uh, some of this. Where do I find closed captioning? For, for oh, Bobby, for, he's putting it on his presentation right now. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't know if, if Zoom could do that. Um, Zoom can, I think it's for, it should say something about transcripts or. That's okay, we'll work on it later. That's fine, okay. I don't wanna hold up your presentation. No worries, no worries. Okay. Um, so I also wanna say a happy Black History Month. Uh, it is February and I know that, you know, even, even right now folks are getting very jittery when you just say black in front of anything. <laughs> and so I just wanna just recognize it's Black History Month. And um, obviously, you know, I hope folks take the time to celebrate the, the achievements and the, the legacy of black people um, and also think about our futurity. 
And um, I just wanted to put that out there that it is Black History Month. And so um, there's a lot of ways to get involved if you're in, in your local community, but also on the WSU campus as well. And so um, if you do have the time to get involved and do some activities or listen to a speaker, um, please do so. And so I think Brandon already touched on who I am. So if you just did forget, right, this is who I am. Um, and Brandon also took this photo. He also knows how to like get my good side because most days I don't look that great, right? So thank you, Brandon, right? And so yes, in the College of Ed, I'm the Associate Dean of Equity Inclusion for Student Success and Retention. That's a very long title, but I'm here for students. Uh, so, you know, everything that goes on about students um, are on the WSU Pullman campus and but also across the campuses, uh, across the state of Washington as well. And so that's, that's my jam. Uh, I'm all about student advocacy and how we can center students, uh, but I'm also an assistant professor in cultural studies, social education. So I graduated, they like me so much that they want to keep me here and here I am. So um, I really wanna open this, this conversation up um, to Amiri Baraka. And so Amiri Baraka is a black queer poet, cultural critic, writer, uh, playwright, um, and he talks about the quality of being. So this is in 1967, and he says, the quality of being is what soul is or what a soul is. What is the quality of your being? Quality here meaning, what does it possess? What a being doesn't possess by default also determines the quality of beings, right? So what you have or what you do not have determines your quality of being as a person in the world, right? So the question I want folks to, you know, in this room to, to ponder and be honest, like, well, what is the quality of your being? When's the last time someone has actually asked you your quality of being? What does that look like? You know, when we do activities or we go to like social gatherings, um, you know, this is probably before COVID, you know, how often do people ask you like, well, what's your quality of your being? And how can we don't focus on the quality of, your, of, of our being, right? And so when I think about um, America, right, as a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, you know, diverse um, country, right, you know, I think about what is the quality of, the, of, of America's being? Like, what's the quality of, of America as a country? What's the quality of the being of this country? Um, what does it possess? What does America possess? And what does it not possess? And I think about how much about, you know, when we think about diversity and equity and inclusion, um, and now we're looking at some pushbacks and some, you know, uh, to these initiatives, you know, I think about what is the quality of being of this country, um, but also I think about what's the direction and future of this country. If we are to, you know, continue to be a multiracial, multi-ethnic state, then, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion should kind of be central to our ideas. And so sometimes I am uh, perplexed or confuddled um, when I, you know, hear about people's resistance um, to, you know, the first, the, the furthering diversification of our country, because that's what our country is all about. And so I, I think about the, the historical aspects of, you know, this, this, this notion of, of our quality of being. I think about the notions of, you know, this, this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how long this, this struggle has gone on for, you know, obviously, you know, human rights and social justice. So I have a few pictures here just to show some comparisons and, you know, just, just to historicize all of this. <laughs> so, you know, one thing my, my dad would tell me uh, growing up, and my dad was born on the eve of the Great Depression, um, and obviously lived through segregation, and, you know, he would tell me that so much of, like, uh, Black history, right, um, he would kind of, like, relate it to jazz, right, and that, like, so much of our history is such in kind of like a, like a loop, right? Uh, or a particular core. And um, things that were past become present. Um, and that's kind of this, the, the shifting nature of, uh, of American life, right? 
And so again, when we think about the quality of being in this country, I, I always think about the historical, but I also think about the contemporary. And I think about how these things are always exchanged or intermingled together, right? So the things that we think are really distant past are not really too past because they are here with us kind of in the present. And so again, I, I think about this notion of our quality of being. What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and then what is, where does DEI fall into all these, these understandings? And so I, I, I you know, connect this into education. And so uh, this is Dr. Gloria Latson Billings, um, and she is huge within our field uh, in education. And she talks about this notion that, you know, we teach what we value. And so, you know, if we are, as a country, as a multiracial, multi-ethnic, diverse, post-racial, allegedly uh, country, right? How do we teach those things? How do we teach those, those, those values, right? Um, and so when we have resistances or pushbacks to, um, you know, diversity, right? Um, it shows that maybe as a country, we may not value these, these ideas, right? And when we don't value certain things, they come out through like our social interactions, our policies and procedures, um, and just kind of like how we live our life. Um, and so this idea that somehow we can separate the things that we value from like our politics or our, our professional nature um, is not always really true because our values always kind of shine through. So quickly, right, what is DEI, right? I'm not trying to, you know, beat this over people's heads, right? So diversity, equity, inclusion, you've probably heard this so many times, but sometimes people forget, like, what are these things, right? And so diversity is the presence of differences that might include race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, uh, social economic status, language, ability, disability, age, religious commitment, or political perspectives. Um, equity is promoting justice, impartiality, right, and fairness within the procedures process. But the most important piece is the distribution or the redistribution of resources by institutions and systems, right? Um, there's a big difference between being, you know, thinking about equality and then thinking about equity. Um, and a lot of people are okay with the idea of equality, but are not really um, happy with the idea of equity. Um, this idea of redistributing resources kind of bothers people. So then when we think about inclusion, right, inclusion is an outcome to ensure that, uh, that those that are diverse actually feel um, welcomed, right? And to feel welcome, I mean, that's a different layer, right? We can bring as many people that we want into a certain space, but if they don't feel included or welcome, then, then are we actually doing what we, what we claim that we're doing, right? And so when I get, when I think about America as this multiracial, multi-ethnic country, we have all these folks from different parts of the world and it's such a beautiful thing, but does everyone feel valued and included? And if we don't, then, then we, we have a problem here. We have a huge problem. And then we have to think about that, right? Again, what is the quality of being of our country? Um, if we are to be this country that is about diversity, but people in this country do not feel welcome, well, what are our values? And so these are all things that we have to really think about or think through. Um, it's one thing to say that we care about certain groups of people, but if folks do not feel welcome, we need to, we need to take that in and we need to do something about it. And so again, I think about what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like. I mean, it's about, you know, embracing people's differences. And, you know, we are all different and we, it's okay to be different. But I think it's also about how we do we embrace differences. And so the importance of all this work is about embracing differences and also making space for people so we can also welcome people for who they are and the differences that we have. I think sometimes we think that there's only a limited space for people and their differences, and that's not true. There's a lot of space for people and differences, but do we make that space? And this is the, the powerful work of, of DEI that, you know, that I do and that so many of my colleagues do within the College of Education. It's making space for others, uh, valuing their humanity, valuing their differences, and valuing them for just who they are. And that's so important because your quality of being is something that matters for me. It just matters. So who benefits from DEI initiatives, right? And, you know, this. You might see the stuff going on in the, the, the newspapers you read or the uh, 
television shows that you might watch, or if you're on social media, you probably see a lot of this about DEI, who it benefits, and um, this idea of us, you know, those that, you know, get um, accommodations for DEI, these are like special benefits. Um, this is just, so there's a lot of discourse um, about DEI. Um, and it comes from a lot of different places, but like who really benefits from DEI? Everybody, right? And I think that's the, the part that folks forget. Um, you know, if you have this idea that space is limited or we're limited on resources, then like you might think that like there's not enough space for everybody. But when we actually do the work critically and we actually to reduce, we get rid of barriers and we create more spaces for people. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion benefits everybody, right? This idea that like everyone should feel welcome for who they are and be embraced for the differences that they have. I feel like that's a great idea to have and a great idea to live by. And so again, I am always perplexed and confuddled um, by folks that have such resistance to the idea that um, making space for everybody is a bad thing. Again, if we are to be this country that we say that we are, then making space for everybody that comes to our country is, makes sense to me. So you might be thinking, you know, reading all this stuff about DEI, what are the challenges? And so this is not a, you know, uh, an exhaustive list here, but there's a few things I just wanted to like raise and highlight um, some of the challenges. Um, so one of the first is not having any ch a mature, you know, DI initiative, right? And so when I mean mature, it's something that's not deep or meaningful or sustainable, right? Uh, it might be like a one-time thing. It's like, well, we did this one thing. We are, you know, we're about diversity. We're post-racial. And it's like, well, what about how do you sustain that? And so making sure that whatever initiative that you're going through is also meaningful and sustainable, right? Um, also thinking about the level of strategic priority, is diversity, equity, inclusion a side priority or is it the central priority? And it's funny because when you center inclusion, everyone benefits, right? And it's something that should be, you know, uh, tied in through everything that you do. Um, and then, you know, usually people can tell when diversity and inclusion is just a side thing that you're just trying to do to appease people, right? When you make DEI a core tenant of what you do, it's a transformative change. And so think about what's the level of priority that diversity, equity, and inclusion really means to you. Um, another is like having a uni uh, a dimensional framework, right? So just making a space just for women or just making a space for, for Black people or making a space for whatever affinity group. Um, sometimes can be great, but what happens when a person has a, um, what happens if you're a Black and a woman? Which, which space do you go to, right? And so this is important to understand that, you know, intersectionality is a really big thing because there's no single issue issue in this country, right? Um, so thinking about the things that people face at, you know, the intersections of their, of their identities is important. And so when we only have, you know, singular groups or certain things, well, we can also leave out a lot of people and a lot of conversations and a lot of issues. So it's and good to incorporate others, right? Lacking the cultural humility, humility or social awareness. And so sometimes folks, especially those in leadership positions, forget the power, privilege, or sometimes they're evasive to the power and privilege that they have. You know, uh, some folks are just not comfortable with the idea of making space for more people or accepting people and embracing folks' differences. Or sometimes they lack that awareness. Um, and that's also a huge problem. Um, subtle, overt pushback and resistance. Obviously, you know, we are kind of seeing that right now, right? That, um, you know, when we when there are trainings about you know diversity and inclusion, people kind of grumble. They're a little upset. Like, why do I gotta go to this? Why is this important? Um, and obviously, we see resistance now. With you know, depending on what state you in and maybe what school district you go to, there might be some resistance from parents or school boards or politicians, media pundits. Like, why are we doing this? Why this is important? Um, so pushback is is there, but pushback has always been there, right? Every time we have tried to change the world. There's always been pushback. There has always been um, resistance. So this is this is not new. This is kind of par for the course. But again, it makes you think. Well, what is the quality of being of America then? If this is something that has continually happened through the course of history, is America as um, inclusive as it thinks it is? That's a question to think about. Also, the dualism of progress. Um, 
or I should say, not to say not even progress, it's a typo. It's a dualism of progress and, and, and not progress, not progressing enough, right? Um, so I think about this idea of, of checking boxes, right? And so some women will say, well, we have, we have a woman here, well, we have a black person here, check, check, we checked our boxes, we're inclusive now, right? Um, but at the same measure, um, some people will say, well, because we have a black person, a woman, this is enough progress. Right, and so we do not need to progress anymore. Um, and that's also a problem when we just simply check a box because some people say, well, how much diversity is too much diversity? And, but that's a terrible framing of thinking about inclusion. If you think you hit a certain number of people and everything is peachy clean. Um, also, you know, you might have direct and indirect criticisms and challenges from members from those that are included. So say if you're an ally and you are working on the behalf of other people, um, they might have some critiques about how you're going about things. They might challenge you on your viewpoints. Um, and if you are truly an ally, that shouldn't really bother you because people are gonna have criticisms. It's about, do you, are you listening? Um, and also how you handle those criticisms that are just um, as equally as important. Um, others, you know, thinking about money, resources, and time or the lack thereof, uh, I think about the budgets when we sometimes do these initiatives. Sometimes people are given roles and not given a budget, or these people, sometimes folks are overtaxed um, or do not have the time to adequately invest or develop certain things. But again, if DEI is the core, that means that you would make money, resources, and time a priority to, to do these things. And so this is how, you know, when we think about strategic priority, it's also tied to money, resources, and time. Also, you know, we rely a lot on those that are marginalized or excluded um, to, to, to do that work, right? So when things do happen, we always turn to those folks in the community that's marginalized to do the work. And if you do have the power and the privilege, you should also take a hand or ownership in this work because this is our country too. Um, and again, it shows what, what, our, what our values are as, as people, as individuals, as a society. Um, I think lastly, you know, there's sometimes confusion. When there's a new initiative comes out, people are like, what is this initiative about? I don't understand it. Um, sometimes, you know, there could be like jargon language. So sometimes people just don't understand, what, what are we doing? What are we, you know, what are we doing and why are we doing this? And sometimes we don't do enough a uh, uh, good work of just explaining things to folks um, and breaking things down and communicating and re-communicating. And so, so sometimes confusion um, is in the air. So sometimes when we think about DEI, right, and the challenges to it, it's like a, talking to a brick wall, right? The, the, the wall separates folks. Um, and, you know, if we are an inclusive place, the whole point of, you know, DEI work is to really get rid of the wall. Why does this wall exist? Um, but the, those challenges, you know, definitely puts up a wall and separates people. Um, and that's, you know, obviously a huge issue. So, you know, what can you do? Uh, and I hear that question a lot. Well, Mayor, what can I do? I'm just one person, individual person. I mean, a, a one person can do a lot of work. So, so please don't ever forget that, right? Um, but also, you know, don't forget the value of the collective. Uh, you know, what can you do? Um, especially if you're really about this work. Uh, I, I think first, think about your commitments. You know, are you doing this work for the right reasons? You know, who are you doing this work for? You know, think about why. Um, and I think sometimes a lot of folks get into this work and don't think about their own commitments or who they're committed to, or, you know, are they actually doing the things that they, they say that they do. Um, also, you know, listening is really important. And I think, I don't think we do enough time or spend enough time in this country actually listening to folks, listening to what they go through, to their needs, their wants and desires. Um, so listening is a, is a huge part of doing, doing this work as well. Um, I can I could say you know read books right which is really really important I don't want to say do your own research because I also see that you know doing your own research has led people down a lot of not good rabbit holes right um, but we we need to we need to you know look upon certain leaders and experts that are in this field of work about like what are the type of books that uh, that you should think about reading or include to your library um, but I also think you know prepare to be challenged. Um, I think that's really important. And people are going to have criticisms. They're going to have things to say. Be, be okay and be comfortable with that, right? Um, especially for those that, that consider themselves to be allies. They're like, you are going to be criticized. You are going to be criticized by the people that you're doing the work for. Well, why are you here? So this is why your commitments are just as important. Because, you know, if you are bothered by, you know, a certain community and you're an ally to them, 
well, are you truly an ally, right? Or if I have to deliver a certain, if I have to deliver my critique in a way that makes you feel comfortable, are you really about this work or are you about, you know, obviously yourself and your own feelings? Things to consider, things to think about. But more so, I really want to just focus in on allyship on the last few minutes that I, I do have here, um, right? And so I, I feel bad that this is from Forbes, but I just like it so much, this, this, this definition, right? And so allyship is a lifelong, it's not just two seconds or you going to a rally or you voting, it's a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. It's a lifelong process. And I think sometimes people forget that this is lifelong. Uh, so not one march or one vote or, you know, uh, an election can, you know, makes you uh, uh, an ally. It's a lifelong thing. So I think, again, think about why are you doing this? Think about your commitments. Are you ready for this? Are you ready to, for this commitment for a long haul? Are you ready for this commitment for the rest of your life? Um, four common misconceptions of allyship, right? Is that performing the performative allyship. So one great example, uh, you know, during 2020 after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Amon Aubrey, right? You know, we had on social media posting the black square um, to, to think about, you know, black people. And I think it was like on a Tuesday. And so on Tuesday, everyone's black square goes up. But then by Wednesday, all the black squares go down because everyone's going back to a life, right? Like I posted my black square, you know, racism is defeated, um, but that's not how it works, right? So there's a lot of performative allyship that exists out here that really annoys, really annoys the hell out of me most days. Um, so again, think about your commitments. Like is the work that I'm doing actually deep enough? Is it meaningful? Is it substantial? Is it gonna change things? Or does it look, or is it just window dressing? Does it make other people just feel good? Um, yeah. um, also, also, you know, platitudes. Platitudes can be very empty gestures, right? And I think a lot of allies will have these platitudes that just don't mean anything, right? Or they say like, I do care about you. Uh, or they will, they will say, let's just say Black Lives Matter, but I will not see them at a meeting or a rally or, they just say things and they kind of go about their day. Um, others, it's just sometimes people, you know, get into uh, roles and just to have a title and a position, right? Um, and that's also wildly problematic. So if you are in a leadership role and DEI is central to what you do, we'll make sure you're actually doing the work, right? So it's going back to your, your actual commitments. Um, but then also perfectionism is getting it right every time, right? You don't always have to be perfect, but you do have to be willing to own and be accountable to the mistakes that you make, right? Again, a, a allyship is a lifelong process, right? So you are going to fumble. You are going to make mistakes. But what do you want to do after that, right? And I think a lot of people, when they get things wrong and they get called out, they're like, well, forget it. I don't want to do this anymore. This is, this is ridiculous. Every time I do something, I get criticized. But again, what is your commitment? Um, are you really committed to being a better person and, and creating change? Or are you just about protecting your own feelings? So you don't have to get things right all the time, but when you do make mistakes, own up to it and be a better person. And so obviously when we look at this allyship iceberg, you have our performative allyship at the top, the thing that just, you know, everyone sees but that real allyship, you know, it's a, the deep, meaningful work that lots of people don't see. It's not a visible practice that you're going to see on, on social media. Because when people are actually out doing the work, they usually don't have time to really post about it because they're out doing the work, right? And so think about that. Like, are you posting this to make the appearance that you are actually helpful? Or are you actually deeply committed to doing this work? So this is just a continuum of what allyship should look like, right? The, you know, the apathetic, we take out the aware, we have active, and then we obviously we have the advocate. I mean, I would love for people um, obviously to be aware, of course. Um, and if you know, we can have people that are active, that's even better. Um, obviously to, to be the advocate is, is, is the ideal, right? Um, I don't need an ally that's apathetic, right? Cause that's not necessary. I don't need that person. Um, to have someone that's aware, uh, to have someone that's active is great, but at the end of the day, to have that advocate means so much. And so I, I wanna bring up this point as I, I'm going home with this, um, you know, about DEI work and, and inclusion and, um, you know, doing social justice work. 
And I want to say that though the world looks like a hellscape, I mean, because some days it does, the world looks the way it is because people said no, right? And I really want folks to think about that, like, even though we have our tough days and our struggles in this country, the world looks the way it is because enough people advocated for other people, right? Um, obviously, I'm speaking to, uh, you know, League of Women Voters here in Pullman, right? And so obviously enough women stood up and said, like, well, women should have the right to vote, right? And so imagine if women didn't. Imagine if people didn't stand up to the enslavement of folks or you know, the internment of, of, of Japanese Americans, right? Think about all these things. If people did not say no, this world will look uh, very um, different, I would say that, right? And so it's important, right? So if, if DEI is at the core of everything that you do, then you, know, you should be comfortable for standing up and saying like, no, we're not gonna do this or this is how we need to change the world. And so I, as I close out, um, this is the beautiful uh, Black queer uh, poet. This is June Jordan. And so talk about this idea of kind of like finding your own where, right? And so as I wrap up about DEI work and, you know, and social justice, uh, social justice becomes like science fiction work, right? It's the stuff that we, we have not happened yet and you're building towards, right? Um, and so as we continue towards a, to being a more diverse more multiracial, more multi-ethnic country, you know, there's certain things that maybe certain barriers that we have to like get rid of, right? Um, and so we have to dream and imagine, you know, new realities for, for folks, right? And so if there are barriers, we have to imagine, you know, getting rid of those barriers, right? And so that's the science fiction element. Um, and so, you know, the, the two questions I'll, I'll leave out with, you know, what does it mean to be made and unmade by our own desires, right? For, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, but also what does it mean to make and unmake the world through our desires, right? And so we are this diverse, multicultural, multi-ethnic state, you know, are these things reflected? Are, are our desires and, and values actually reflected in the things and the principles that we believe and stand up upon? But if not, then there's a lot of work to be done. And so lastly, you know, centering DEI might ruffle some feathers because it usually does, but what is the quality of their being in there? I'm thinking about those that are marginalized, those that are excluded, right? You have to think about like at the end of the day, like, yeah, it's gonna ruffle some people that might have the power and the privilege, um, but what is the quality of the people that have been historically marginalized and now you know, continually to be marginalized in, in this country, right? And so I, I want folks to really think about that and take that up. And so that's, that's the end of my uh, presentation here. Their questions. Uh, shall uh, uh, have you unshared? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Great presentation. That was so thought provoking. I'm looking forward to watching it again because I just loved the things. I got to get that definition of allyship. That was just really, really good. Um, do we have any questions? So thank you. Do we have any questions from people? Because I do think it is a, um, a topic that we're all trying to figure out how we can be better in this regard. And um, I've I got would, a question. Yeah, yeah, I've got a question. Um, you, you, um, Amir, you, you mentioned the, um, you know, the black boxes um, and who knows from day to day what the next thing is going to be, right? Um, I, I know this month, because Black History Month, uh, I've seen a number of posts, especially uh, like on the 1st of February, uh, you know, folks saying, okay, it's great to acknowledge this on social media, but what, what's the action going to be? Like, what are we going to do? And I, I think I, I probably am in the same position that a lot of people are in saying, I, I don't know what to do, right? That's, that's where um, the, the best I can think of is to, um, you know, to speak up if I see an injustice. But other than that, I, I don't know, right? Uh, because it's, it's, it's really not something I, I, I'm, I'm burdened with, you know, feeling some kind of uh, racism against me, you know, and so what, what, what can somebody who, um, you know, who may uh, feel strongly the DEI is, is vital to our society, but, but just doesn't know what, what that action could be? Um, that's, a, that's a damn good question, Brandon. Um, I, I, I would think, you know, 
I think obviously having spaces like this is one, number one important. Cause I think sometimes we don't spend enough time talking to each other about things that we wanna do, right? Sometimes we can be, we, you know, we can do things in silos or we can operate in silos or we can think in silos. And so having communal spaces of, of really thinking about these things, I think it's really powerful and important. Um, but again, I, I want folks to think about like, you know, as even as individuals, you do have the collective power of making change and organizing and doing things and shaping, you know, if it's just the city or it could be the state, I mean, uh, or the county to, to things that you want to see in the world, right? And so I, I would say, don't forget that. Um, obviously, you know, um, I would also say, you know, reach out to professors, right? Um, and so like, I think sometimes this, this, this community between like, you know, folks that live in Pullman and obviously we have, you know, professors, I think we need to build better collaborations between like obviously the institutions that we have and then obviously the, you know, community leaders and, and people, residents that live in, you know, obviously cities and towns because that's, that's really important. Um, right. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I, I work right in, in Pullman and I, and I care about the community. Um, but that's why I'm also here to like have, have these conversations. So I think fostering better community, you know, communal relations and deepening our relationships um, is just as, as important. Um, and I think the last thing, you know, I think it's really important that like when, when you do see issues, right, to, to call it out, um, because I think that that shows about your temperament of who you are as a person, right? Um, right, because sometimes people will say like, well, you know, what type of person would you be, you know, during the civil rights movement, right? And obviously how you are right now will probably be the same person you would be during that move, you know, during that moment, because there was a lot of stuff happening, right? And so the things you do right now would also determine probably who you would be during those times, right? And so I think it's really important if, if there is something that is happening, you know, to, to feel comfortable enough to, to, to really address it and to, to make that change. Um, and I think sometimes folks do not feel comfortable enough making a change, or they might feel hesitant or scared or worried or, you know, so this is why I think having communities like this or having spaces like this where people can talk, people can organize, people can think through their ideas um, is really, really important. So don't forget about the power of the individual, but also do not forget about the power of community because community is what makes things really change. Um, so I'll stop there because I can just keep on chatting, but yes. I have more of a comment than mm -hmm. anything else probably. So um, first of all, I feel, I have felt amazingly lucky to be able to raise um, my kids in Pullman in such a diverse community. One of, uh, I was really worried when we moved here that there would be no diversity and my kids ended up going to Franklin when Franklin was the English as a second language school. You know, they ended up having friends from all over the world. And I think that has made su such, a, such an acceptance for them. Um, I grew up in a little town in Western South Dakota in the sticks. Like 99.9% .9 of the people in the town I grew up in were white. And I think it's knowing people who are who are not like you that makes the big difference. And I wish we could just, you know, put our country in a big bowl, shake them all up. And, <laughs> and um, because I think it's it's exposure to people that are different than you that makes a, such a huge difference in a personal way. Um, and I don't know how, you know, I don't know. That's that's kind of my comment is if somehow we could um, if we could get people to accept people as people, you know, that people are just people. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> no, I, um, Good comments. I'm listening to what you, so I, I, I'm listening to what you're saying. I think, you know, uh, I think, well, one, thank you for, 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 you know, obviously sharing, for sharing your, 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 your commentary, I think with us in this space. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard, right? Like where we're at as a country, you know, obviously this is kind of like a broken record, but like, you know, we are so deeply entrenched into like how we see the world and our beliefs. And, you know, I think sometimes dialogue also really does break down. Um, and so I think even trying to foster spaces where people can like have conversation, that's, that's hard and that's rare. And COVID has not helped, right? Because we are now more, even more isolated, right? And, you know, so I, I think, 
what I will say is that I think sometimes people do not have enough experience with just obviously, you know, you know, being in spaces of different, you know, different people, different viewpoints. Um, and I think that's hard because then when that person is in a different space and they are challenged on an idea that, you know, obviously the natural inclination is to get very defensive, to double down, uh, to, to, to isolate yourself. Um, and so I think it, it, it's hard, right? You know, I'm a teacher educator, so I teach teachers how to be teachers. And I spend a lot of time listening to the things that my teacher candidates say. And, you know, they, they say some things and I'm like, oof, ouch, you know, it hurts. Um, but I also know that, you know, what's, the, what's my mission, right? And so obviously um, I have to listen to what they're saying and meet them where they're at, um, but also try to, you know, instill, you know, different, not I won't say different beliefs, but just try to say that like, there's also different perspectives I need you to think about. Um, that just because you have lived your life one way doesn't mean you can't live your life another way or you, you know, to think broader than what you're thinking about, um, especially as a teacher, because you're gonna have such a, a, a ride or array of you know students from different you know different places of the country maybe around the world different languages different abilities different skill sets and you have to be you know inclusive to all and I think we forget about the the the, the power and importance of in inclusion right and so uh, I can keep going on about this but I think also you know if you say the wrong thing sometimes you definitely can get you know excluded out. Um, and I think, you know, as a country, we, we really have to negotiate, you know, the importance of that as well, right? Like, what is the end goal, right? Is the end goal for me to cast you aside and get rid of you? Or do I value you as a person and I want you to do better and to, make, you know, to own your, your mistakes and to hold you accountable? Um, and so I think as a country, we also have to wrestle with like, well, what do we want when we encounter issues with people that might say or do something bad? Do we, do we give them the space um, that they can make the mistake and, and change? Or do we just cast them aside? So there's a lot of work that I think we we also need to do. Um, but also, lastly, I would say like, are people really open and willing to have these conversations? And I think sometimes I get disappointed when people close their minds and their hearts off to to the idea of change, right? Because there was a time in this country where like having enslaved Africans was okay. There was a time in this country where like women should not vote. There was a time where like gay people should not be married, right? Like just so there was always this time, right? So um, when people start closing off their minds and their hearts to, to change and difference and embracing differences, um, it's, it hurts. Um, Dr. Gilmore, uh, you know, I, I'm really impressed when my, my kids come home, um, some of the things that they, they are learning um, in this sphere that I feel like, it felt like is way beyond what, what I was taught in school. Um, and that gives me hope, but there's so much room, I guess, that we still need to improve on. How, how are you able to stay, um, I, I guess, advocate for this and not get uh, discouraged? Like, how do you how do you keep hope in, in this? Because it could probably be really discouraging, I would imagine. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is. Um, it's hard. It's tough. Uh, but I think about the, the historical, right? There's, there's always been moments in this country where, like, there's a, you know, obviously demand for social change and there's always this type of resistance. So I, I, I tried to center that idea that like, this is a part of the process of, of living in a country of such where folks have different ideals and, and, and ideologies and, and viewpoints and come from different backgrounds, right? Um, I, I also think about, you know, if people before me gave up when it got hard or tough, well, where would I be, right? Like I I'm only exist because of other people I uh, took up that mantle so like, well, I want change for obviously the future, right? And so I, I have to keep that hope alive that like, you know, by staying in this fight and doing the good work that we can also, you know, make that future that, that, that we all want, right? Because if we all just give up now, we all just pack it in, well, nothing's going to get done, right? And so it, it's a fight that you just have to, you know, keep to the end. Um, how I, I continue to stay, I think hopeful, you know, I'll go back to education, right? So as a teacher, educator, I listen to my teacher candidates and, you know, they do say some things and I'm just like, well, we got to work on this, right? But they also say a lot of things that like inspire hope. And I'm just like, wow, like, you know, look at this, you know, 21, 22, maybe 23 year old that like has a, a, a firm understanding of like, you know, of themselves, of their, their political commute, commitments, but also like, you know, of what they, you know, what they want to bring into the classroom and to really, you know, sustain, you know, the matterings of, of, of their students. And that for me, I'm just like, oh, whew. 
I feel so good, right? You know, that like there are, there are, you know, people in this world that are doing this work. And I think I'll say that I'll, you know, I'll end the, the question on that. There, don't forget that there are people doing this work. And so like, yes, it might seem tough and terrible and hard, but there are people in the grassroots that are doing this work every day. And so don't forget that there are people in this world that are fighting for, for these, um, you know, these, 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 these values to, to change the world. Um, and so we we got to we got to keep up uh, the, the I guess the, the struggle the fight for this because if we fold if we fold then nothing will, will come of this um, and I am thankful for the youth that we have right now as an older person now or getting older I'm thankful for 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 young people for just even with the stuff that they do on TikTok the activism that they get in themselves involved in how they disrupt and shake up things. Um, their demand for like, no, we want to know the actual history of this country, right? Like listening to, to what youth say is really important. And so I think as adults, older people, right? I think it's really important that we also make space for youth and think about, you know, what do they want and what do they want to see in the world and what's their ideas? Uh, because their ideas alone could also reshape or shape the world too. So don't forget about, you know, the students and kids, um, because they have a they have a real uh, important place in in this in this you know journey this fight. I have a question. Um, I don't know if anybody else has one, but anyway, uh, so as the president of the Pullman League of Women Voters, um, you know I've read our DEI statement, but we, I don't know if any of our members are. I mean, we have maybe a little bit of diversity, but not. I would not say as much as I'd like to have. Mm -hmm. So I think um, my question would be, I don't know, how do we, and I, I think in terms of our organization, in fact, some of our roots of our organization with Frederick Douglass working with, um, was it Carrie, Alice, you would know, Carrie Chapman too, uh, on, um, on, you know, the whole process through the beginning of the League of Women Voters and getting the right to vote and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it, it's not, it, it's like a natural connection. It should be a natural connection that, because the, the things that, that work for the things that the League of Women Voters stand for, um, you know, healthcare and, and civics education and, you know, DEI and, um, and the policies and the right to vote, you know, all of that is in there with the things that that I believe um, a, a more diverse population would be supporting, and we would like to have them and have that conversation uh, in our organization. But we haven't been able to rally that somehow. So I'm open to ideas. Mm. Um, I, I think that's a really good. Uh really good question about like, you know, how, well, what, what's the starting point or like, even though you are, you know, you have these values and you're, you're open to, uh, you know, making space for other people, then, you know, like, where are the people, right? Um, but I also think about, you know, um, to, to your point, we think about like uh, women's suffrage um, um, or just even like, you know, we think about like feminism or, or either, so there's a lot of the, the, what I'm trying to say, like there's a lot of historical things about, um, I would say like even addressing issues of racism, right? um that 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 comes with certain with certain groups right so when i think about women's suffrage right obviously it was about women voting but it was white women right and so i think about like you know how do we also address the historic pieces right um because oh, like, and we and believe me it always does come up yes yes <laughs> yes they, they right? did not do that very well back then <laughs> yes right and so i think that's something that's really important for for i think for spaces like this to, to really think through and think about um, because that historical legacy could still be out there, right? Um, yeah. So I think, um, I think as as an organization, like you know, how do you address that? Well, where do you start addressing that? Or like, how do you speak to that? And mm -hmm. you know, it could be the fact that maybe you try to invite more, you know, women of color speakers to like, you know, speak, you know, before the group, or you know, just try to have more involvement. There might just be you might need to try different ways and avenues to to really, you know, talk. Uh, maybe yeah. it's something that you might want to do door to door, right? You know, like, hey, like, we're the uh, League of Women Voters and, you know, we're looking for, you know, new membership. Would you be interested? Um, this is what we're about. These are our core focuses. 
um, you know, and we, we want to have different perspectives and opinions to, you know, better, you know, obviously the, the community, right? And so I, I think that's also, you know, really, really important. Um, and, and I feel like I, I can keep going. Okay, so, that's yeah. fine. Uh, but if you think of any, any strategies or, I mean, door to door, certainly, but, uh, or phone calling or what have you, but um, I just, you know, image or however we can promote that. You know, the National League of Women Voters president uh, is a black woman, mm -hmm. uh, Deborah Turner. And, mm -hmm. she, and she's and she been out there on the front lines doing all kinds of great stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, we and we've had uh, an attorney with the National League of Women Voters who spoke with us, spoke to us last year and all the cases that she's, mm -hmm. she's a black woman and all the cases that she's been on uh, on the front lines of, and she was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I think be before I go to uh, Francine, uh, so I, I'll, I'll leave you with this, right? And I have this conversation with my department chair, uh, right? And so within, obviously we know the dynamics of, of you know, the teacher workforce, uh, majority white, majority white women, right? Um, and so the, obviously that's the historical, right? And that's the contemporary right now. And so if I was a person of color, well, why would I want to become a teacher, right? If I am only going to, if I'm going to be like that sole person or the sole voice or, you know, the, the, the sole person or the ambassador representative of something, well, why would I want to go through this? Or, you know, will I feel safe in this space, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something also to really think about, because if, if I am a person of color coming into a space that, you know, might be white, Right. I need to think about like, well, what, what is, what's the political backgrounds of, of the people of this organization? Will I feel safe? Will I be marginalized? Will I be excluded? Will they tokenize me? Right. And mm -hmm. so let like, all these questions go in the back of the mind of, of someone that may not be white. Right. And so I think about that in relation to our teacher candidates, because like how things stay white. It's like, you know, if you're a person of color, like, well, why would you want to be in a space that's majority white? Will you, will you be safe? Will you be trusted? Will people respect who you are? And so that's always sometimes a deterrent, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and so it, it's it's a really it's a really hard thing. So I think the, the more that you work on as an organization about like ensuring that like it is safe, um, and that you know we can have um, you know a diverse range of folks uh, in this organization. Not to say that you don't believe it, but like I think other people have to feel it and believe it as well, right? Because we can have right. these ideals, but if people themselves don't feel it and believe it, it's tough. You know, it would be really great if we could figure out how we could go into a predominantly black organization or Hispanic organization. I mean, if you, we could get invited in to speak about who we are, you know, and then we get to go in as the minority, if you like. And um, it's good to have that kind of experience, I think. Mm -hmm. There was someone on here that uh, wanted to speak. They had their mm -hmm. hand raised. Dr. Uh, Watson. Okay, is she still here? Yes. Hello. Hi, Bobby. Thanks um, for hosting this. I definitely am a colleague of Amir's and um, Brandon, too. And I've always wanted to hang out in a, with a League of Women Voter event. So thanking the virtual space. <laughs> um, you know, Amir, thank you for your talk. It's always great. I mean, we work together every day and I always learn something from you every time um, I listen to your talks and you help me frame things. And um, I just wanted to share, you know, I'm a Pullman, I've been here 15 years now. I feel like um, I'm just starting to uh, figure things out. And um, right now I, I have some, some deep concerns about the legislation in um, affecting schools and teachers right now. And I think, you know, historically, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know exactly know how to frame my question, but I'll, I'll put in the chat a, 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 an episode of Terry Gross of Fresh Air today and Jeffrey Sachs doing a study of 35 states and the legislation right now restricting what teachers teach and what they say. So I, I'm, I'm curious, Amir, you know, what are, I, I think of the League of Women, Women Voters and I think of structures like school boards and being some of kind of the base architecture of public school education should be the hallmark space of civics education. Um, the, the absolute you know, notion that we could build a public education system um, that is democratic, right? And right now what we're witness to is the silencing of teachers and 
problematically still remains predominantly white, but on the flip side, it is predominantly women. And so when I put these pieces together, I see these, the possibility for some pretty powerful alliances where like threat of firing and losing your job for teaching the truth um, and teaching a shared history. And that is truly what we're facing. I have never, I'm, I've been an educator for 25 years. I have never, it's almost heart stopping to see what is happening right now from a voting standpoint, from a, a civic standpoint, from a teaching the truth standpoint. And so I just, you know, since we're in the space of the League of Women Voters, I would just, maybe it's just kind of, you know, right here, right now, or maybe it's some thoughts you've had to this, but yeah. what are some new alliances that some of these old structures could form to inspire the kind of dialogue that I think, Bobby, you were just referring to, right? Like in local, local spaces like Pullman right here, I have listened to school board meetings and I'm, it, it that's a place where we need to have dialogue, you know, to be thinking about what we teach, what we stand for, um, and so I'll pause right there because I'm all like, whoa, um, but I'll leave it to you, Amir. And, and um, you know, maybe this is a bookmark too big of a topic for the end of your of our time. Well, I'm not sure when it ends, but thank you for please, hearing. Please do. Yeah. Thank you for those comments, because I tried to listen to that uh, NPR piece. And um, it's bizarre how that critical race theory la la came about. Um, and I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And so uh, uh, Terry Gross and her guests were addressing that, but I, I wasn't getting good reception. I was on the road. So I would very much like to have that link. Uh, I, I could look it up, but if you happen to have it. I just put it in the chat. chat. Yep, it's yeah. in the mm -hmm. I wanted to say that. And then the second thing is you should join us. We need your voice. And, <laughs> uh, and besides that, we're a lot of fun. So, <laughs> and we get stuff done. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, Fred, I think this is a, a powerful question. And, um, you know, so just before this talk, you know, I'm like looking at notes and I was like reading something on Twitter that uh, uh, school district in, in Alabama, uh, they were parents are like calling the, the superintendent of schools saying that Black History Month is critical race theory. And I'm like, well, this is where we're at in this country where like, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of people are upset and mad, but like, we're, we're, I mean, Black History Month and Black Black History is also American history as well, right? So that that shared history that's, um, you know, but also different perspectives needs to be taught. But again, we have to think about like, well, who are we as a country? What's the quality of our being here? Like, are we really this this country that is, you know, allegedly post-racial or that we are this, this diverse and open and, and openly tolerant place or are we not? And I, I feel like where, where we're at, you know, in this cycle is that people are rejecting this notion that we are. Um, and people kind of want to go back to what they know, what they feel comfortable. They don't want to talk about this. I mean, even the idea of talking about MLK is now seen as critical race theory or <laughs> Marxism or Ruby Bridges now is Marxism. I mean, like, so any, I mean, like everything will, will be something. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's deeply problematic. And so I think, you know, again, having spaces like this, I know there's also like Blue's core as well. And so there are grassroots organizations that are that are, are fighting this. Um, but I think, you know, obviously just having having these shared spaces and and you know, you know, knocking down these silos and um, obviously, you know, attendance, you know, these school board meetings and like putting your commentary into this. Um, and no part in the history of the world, I will say this, right? Um, that banning books <laughs> or, or banning people to say things, you've never been on the side of the good guys, right? Or the good people, right? As soon as you start banning people to speak uh, or banning books, banning ideas, well, you know, I got some questions because no history, no, no, no country or any part of the history of the, the world where like those people have been good, right? And so, uh, you know, You know, for me, at the end of the day, right, you know, uh, we folks, some folks have to move past the idea that like they feel guilty or they have guilt, right, you know, because this is our history. The question becomes like, what do we want to do about it, right? Um, so for me as a man, um, you know, obviously there's some things that I don't know or realize because I'm a man, right, that male privilege. So things about girls and women, sometimes I forget, but I don't feel guilty. I'm just like, well, 
thank you for bringing that to my attention. I want to do better. And so I think for, for me as a country, well, why don't we want to do better? And I think that's, that's what's heartbreaking, that folks do not want to do better. They do not want to be challenged. They want to be, they want to stay comfortable. They want to be entrenched in their views. They do not want to have dialogue. Um, and I think it's, it's deeply problematic. Um, and so I think, yes, having these spaces and having this dialogue is really important and that we should stop, we should not stop having these dialogues, right? And so this is not, let's not be like a one-time talk and like, well, we're done here. Or you speak to the school board once and like, well, we're done here. Um, you know, if we are about these things if we're about these ideals, these principles um, that we, we need to show up in these spaces, we need to organize, um, but we also need to also bring people in, right? And so, uh, just because we might disagree on certain things, it's like, doesn't mean like I'm gonna throw away your humanity as a person, right? And so how do we also bring other people into the fold, into the conversation? Um, and, yeah, and I don't think we've, we've gotten it down yet as a country, right, in, in this current stage. Professor Gilmore, I just wanted to have you continue with that with your own training of teachers, because it strikes me that the last four years, the last 20 years, you've taken this huge lid off of, of, of underlying sort of issues of hate and racism and uh, the, and it's very ugly and it's very up on the surface. And this, clearly you are potentially training teachers who are going out into that kind of conflict. And uh, just curious about how are you preparing them to deal with it? Because it doesn't strike me that it's a matter of, oh, can I listen to them? Because when you listen to them, you're listening to something that is really very, very ugly and negative and not wanting any of the things that you're talking about in terms of DEI. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that's one of the, the hardest things. And so, again, I love the, I love the job that I have. And it's, it's a tough job because teacher candidates keep me on my toes because sometimes they will say things and I'm like, whew. We have some work to do, or where did you get this view from? And so I have learned over time, right? I have to meet people where they're at. And so I don't know, you know, you know, their history or their, their whole story, right? But I already know from what they have told me. And so like I need to do that deeper work to find out like, you know, who they are, their experience, or well, why do they hold these beliefs? Um, and you know, are they willing to like recognize that maybe some of their beliefs might need to be changed or they could be wrong? Um, and so it's a, it's a very tender process, right? Um, and no, and like, I'm not, you know, I, I tell my students at the beginning of the semester, I'm not here to cancel you. This is not a gotcha moment, right? Like I tell my students every day that I'm invested in them 110% because I want them to be the best because they're going to be out in the state of Washington teaching kids, right? Students, right? And so I have to be deeply invested into them. So if they do make a mistake or a faux pas, you know, I'm just like, well, why do you believe this? But I, I also bring them in. I also leave with love um, and say like, well, hey, you know, of course you made this mistake, um, but I need you to think about it in this way. Or, you know, if I was a student in your class and I heard these remarks, well, how would you think I would feel, right? And so building on these, 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 these notions and ideas are, are really important. Um, but also, you know, from the books that I read in class, I mean, like, it's a always, I'm challenging students, right? And I tell them from the get-go, they're like, hey, if you're taking my class, right, you, some of the things that you hold really dear, you might be challenged on and you might be uncomfortable. That's also okay. You, you know, I also have them dialogue with their own peers and colleagues, and they're all from different parts of the state of Washington. And it's like, you may not always agree, but that's also okay, right? Like, but what is the mission and value of being a teacher, right? I know that in the state of Washington, right, as a teacher educator, I need to make sure that every teacher candidate that goes out is able to teach to all students, right? And so like, what does it mean to teach to all students? That means that we need to incorporate, you know, obviously issues of DEI, accessibility, all these values. Um, I guess the, the hardest part is when I have teacher candidates that don't, right? And then that's a deeper conversation, right? Um, because that's, that's important. So lastly, I told my, my, my teacher candidates who happen to be mostly white, um, that like you as a white person can still do this work. You can still be in a classroom with, you know, a, a diverse, diverse group of folks and still be connected. You can still teach history. You can do so many dynamic things. So you being white is, doesn't really mean too much. It's about, well, what are you going to do in that space that really ensures the mattering or the inclusion of your students? That's what students really care about. Um, you know, like, yeah, you're white, but like, well, how are you going to make your students feel safe or feel centered or feel loved? Or how are you going to teach them in an appropriate manner where they learn and grow? Um, and I think that's really important. So I try to model that in my own class in hopes that they, they may model that themselves 
as 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 teachers. And it's a really it's a really um, it's a fragile process. It's a tough process. Um, some days I walk away hurt, but then I come back the next day because I'm like, well, what is my mission? My mission is to make sure that you know my my students are are ready to to teach you know the, the future of America, right? And so, um, yeah. Oh, thank you. It, although it strikes me that often the diversity that your students will confront has got a lot of diversity that includes hate, that includes rejection of exactly the kind of history you're talking about that your the uh, both of your teachers ought to be able to teach and confront. Um, and uh, again, as has been mentioned, uh, the uh, I'm just one of those people who really worries about compare, really worries about the U.S. in the last four years of what's going to happen because it doesn't feel good. It's not about a matter of feeling good. I think it feels quite dangerous. Yeah, and, um, I, and I, uh, is it is it Alexander or Alex? It's just Alex is fine. Okay, um, so Alex, I, and I, I hear what you're saying, and I think also as as universities, as a as a teacher education program, we also have to do better, right? So rethinking about you know what's what's the current landscape of our country, like how do we redo even teacher education programs, right? Um, because it's a, it, you're, what you're saying is true, because there's a lot of diverse thoughts, right, that also lead with hate, and that also not acceptable as well, right? And so even as I know that we have teacher shortages and we need teachers, but we don't just need anybody, right? And that's also something that we need to, to hold, hold firm on. Um, I had one more point to, 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 what, you, to what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think we just, we need to, we need to do, uh, I think teacher education programs also just need to do a better job of uh, really like, making DEI really central into the things that we, we, we know and love, right? And so um, my class is only a 10 week class, right? And so I impact such a wide range of topics. And so I, I you know, I do the best that I can in my 10 weeks. Um, but I also think like, well, what is it, what would it look like if we could have like an all year long seminar or if for two years to really focus on some of these, these, these notions and ideas? Um, Cause I feel like sometimes students or teacher kids, they don't have enough time to really unpack themselves or unpack their own thoughts before they actually also go out into the world and go teach. Um, and so sometimes, you know, teacher education programs can do a disservice because we like kind of like speed teachers along so they can go out and teach. Um, but we really want to make sure that like, you know, do they hold these values to be true? Um, can they teach all, um, can they teach all students? And that's something that's really meaningful and, and, and deep. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I think we as an institution, as a program also, we have work to do our, our, ourselves. Thanks. Um, does, uh, I, I just wanna comment on that your idea of, I mean, we have a calendar, the League of Women Voters has a calendar of presentations like yours and, and we, we widely publicize it uh, both in the newspaper, our, our events and uh, on our website. Um, and I think as we put together this calendar for the next year, I think next year we, I'm going to raise that we talk about what can we do if Black History Month is a, is a great time to focus on, I mean, we should focus on it all the time, but maybe we could do some more events. And so I'd really like to connect with you, Amir, about help us, help us find some great ways that we could uh, really energize. And it doesn't have to be in March, right? We can do right. it. We can do it anytime, but um, I think that would be one thing that that might be another way that we could do more. And it might be where, like I say, we go in to a different world. And I suspect next year we'll probably still be doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Which I, I'm with Francine Watson. I think it's Zooms. Zoom is. I've met a lot more people over Zoom. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. Um, and then we do have a question though from um, from uh, Francie Bowes. And Francie, are you still here? Do you want to ask that? I'm looking for the question. Just a minute. Oh, okay. Here it is. Nope, that's what. How do we how do we talk to people that disagree? Uh, yes, there you yes. go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a question. I just been loving what you've been saying, but very concerned about. Yes. Very concerned about the country. Yes. I mean, because my my feeling is that. We are become. We are really become. We are becoming aware of what we've always been, 
and is not pretty. And that's why people are having such a hard time accepting it. I, I don't know what my question would be. No, I, I think, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And uh, well, you know, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're, what you are saying, right? That we are becoming what we, what we know we are, right? Or what we hope, you know, what we distance ourselves to be. Um, and I think for a lot of folks that have been excluded or marginalized, this is kind of like par for the course. This is a, another day in the life uh, living in America, right? And so, um, you know, what, what do we do? Um, but I think to, to what you had, you know, put in the chat about like, how do we, you know, even talk to people that we disagree with? I mean, communicating is a lifelong practice as well, right? Because, uh, you know, no one really teaches us how to communicate either, right? We just kind of like learn by doing things. I mean, obviously there's schools for communication, right, Brandon, right? <laughs> um, but I, I also think that like, you know, we, we get into, we get entrenched into our values and our beliefs. And sometimes we forget about that there are other people that exist in the world that have different values, different ideas. Um, and I think it's hard, you know, where do we begin to parse out like, well, what ideas that I, you know, why is what I listen to that I just don't, you know, that I don't agree with, or what ideas are, you know, hateful, right? So we, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of complexity. Um, well, you have to be a lot, have to be very confident. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just think of situations where, um, well, one situation in my life that uh, I was talking with a, a, f a person from another country who was here in the United States and and thinks that um, that the black people are just lazy because, you know, look at me. I came here uh, with ten dollars in my pocket and look at what I am. I'm a professor. Well, he didn't even recognize all the pluses he had in growing up and the kind of fan things he had in his country and 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 my reason for bringing it up is that I was so upset by it but I didn't say anything you know I, I should have said something you know um or my brother who who likes to hunt and fish and lives in Wisconsin and does doesn't recognize that you know why do the Indians get to hunt any time they want I mean just this total unawareness yeah. of, uh, of what our privilege and so on. And and how do you how do you react to that? I, I think, you know, one, I think the so I guess to go backwards, right? To to even uh, make people aware of their own privilege is, is one of the hardest things, right? And so I mean, we're all people, we all are situated in our own standpoint. So like, obviously there's, there's gonna be things that we just don't see or know or understand, or we, we lack the awareness of. Yeah. And I think, you know, where we exist in this country, like no one wants to be wrong and everyone has the right answer, right? And so no one can just say like, well, I didn't know that, or I didn't think about that, or maybe I need to do more reading, or I'm sorry, I don't, or I don't have all the information. These are things that people could say, but we don't. We double down on what we believe, uh, what we hear from other people. Um, you know, we, we scapegoat, right? We do a lot of, we do a lot of things to avoid uh, accountability or just to even learn history. Um, and I think that's something that's, you know, also really hurtful. But I also think because this is America, uh, I think about like how individualism is the most, one of the most powerful driving forces, right? Like if I can make it, well, why can't these other groups of people make it? And that's just totally dismissing the histories of what people have gone through, right? Um, and so like that is something that's also like shows a lack of, of awareness. Um, and I think it's really hard because, you know, before, you know, I used to do these conversations and I would say like, people just need to do their own research, right? And I'm like, oh, I, I solved it, I'm done, right? But now we're at this point where people are doing their own research and they're just further entrenching themselves into their own ideas and values, right? So I can't even tell a person to go into Google and look it up because they'll go into Google and look up something that they want to look up. Right, that confirms their own biases. Um, and it, it's, it's a really hard thing. And um, what, what I will say is that, you know, some people have to be ready for, uh, ready and open to, to be known that they could be wrong. And I think sometimes it's like, are people truly ready? And it's no. Um, and I think as a person that might disagree with someone, right? Like you have to be, you know, you have to wait and have that patience. Like, well, are they gonna be ready today? Maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. Um, and you know, continue that support, but also like continue to, to speak up, 
right? So when there is something that is wrong, you should address it like, oh, I don't, that's wrong. Or well, why do you think this? Or maybe you should, have you considered this? Or, um, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's important that we also challenge people to do better, right? Like, I don't wanna say like people are wrong or they, they are ignorant or stupid. I don't wanna go down that path, but I wanna challenge people to do better, right? To know and to do better. Because when you know, you usually do better, right? And so uh, that's, that's, and that's, I think that's one of the, the hardest things is to challenge people to, to do better. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. Of course. I, I wanna correct something. I think I said the month of March is Black History Month. That's, I think I, Mar, Mar, Black History Month is now, it's February, right? Because Martin <laughs> Luther King and all, I got that one wrong. It's, uh, and then that, that flows into March is Women's History Month. So you know, a lot of times the two of them are working together. So I just think there's an opportunity next year for us to try to feature some great, great programs that speak about uh, those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the other thing I want to pump for League of Women Voters is um, I, uh, one person said, you know, there, well, many have said, I'm so concerned. And I, I feel that the League of Women Voters is a platform where we can have um, civil discourse. I mean, we're, uh, that is our, a harm, hallmark of what we are, is where can we have civil discourse? And, um, uh, and there's a lot of research going on uh, through the League of Women Voters about misinformation and how that's, you know, what it's doing to, to our uh, electoral processes. And um, so we are one of those places where I, I, I completely identify with people that have said that, you know, this is terrifying, what can we do? And they, and, and they get angry and they get sad and get panicked. And I think that we have to harness those emotions and put them in a constructive way. And for me, um, I, uh, I, I joined the League of Women Voters um, quite honestly, when I just was so frustrated about what was going on uh, with our um, democracy. And uh, I think it, it, it calmed down my, um, my it, it didn't calm my voice, but it certainly made me listen for where those opportunities are, for where I can have an impact and where I can, uh, going on Facebook and blasting whatever I felt was not a really good idea. Was, you know, it's a great way to lose friends make enemies actually. So uh, doing, you know, more constructive and positive things, I think will get, a, uh, I, I believe gets, gets us further. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to take the hard, you know, sometimes you got to protest. I'm not going to say there's not a place for protest, but um, two-way conversations can go a long way. I agree. Uh, Leah, am I saying your name correct? Leah? <clears throat> Leah, Leah's great. Um, so uh, I work for a, a tech company and I do some hiring for them. Um, and since, I mean, I, I grew up in uh, inner city Chicago. So I had a little more background with diversity than some others here. Um, but I also, you know, I, I ever since the, George Floyd stuff, I started doing the work, reading the books, um, <clears throat> trying to get my head around every, everything in history that's, been, that's gone on other than the things that I know from school because they definitely teach some stuff about, about that kind of history in Chicago schools that I don't think that's ever gonna change. Um, but I, I, I've been doing some hiring at my, at my work um, and I had a conversation with somebody <clears throat> and I, we had a disagreement because I told them that if I had two candidates who were equal in all things, that I would pick the diverse candidate. And they were like, well, why would you do that? That doesn't seem fair. And I'm like, no, because this person probably had a lot more things to overcome to get to where they are. And so I give them that as they're like one up for two equal candidates. Um, and they did not think that was a great idea. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether uh, 
I'm the one in the wrong on this situation or if there's a better way to explain my reason for feeling like, you know, if you grew up privileged, then you had all these opportunities to learn technology more than someone else who did not. And so I want to give them that benefit. Um, this is tricky, right? And so what I appreciate you bringing it to the, <laughs> the, to the forefront, right? Uh, it's, it's a really tricky thing, uh, right? And like, obviously, I don't know if folks here are like you know, watching the stuff that's happening with the NFL and hiring and, um, you know, we, we, yeah. we, you know, issues of you oh, know, yeah. uh, quote unquote affirmative action. Um, I mean, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to say. I mean, what I, but if a company that you're employed by, you know, values, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and, you know, we got to think about like institutional fit, which it can also be a very problematic thing because sometimes people say, you know, they want to have the best candidate or they want to find, you know, someone that fits. And well, if your company happens to be all white, right? So the fit is gonna be usually someone that is not of color, right? Um, and so I think that there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that really go into that. But one thing I, I will say is that usually when we talk about hiring um, and we start talking about, um, you know, people of color, people from marginalized backgrounds, excluded backgrounds, um, this idea of like a quality candidate that is uh, like, that is not white, Right, they they don't people don't think that's a possibility, right? Like those two things can't go together, right? So if you are going to hire a, a quote unquote minority candidate, that they are not highly qualified, and the question becomes, well, why do people have this idea that like if you are a person of color and you are a job candidate, that you wouldn't be a quality hire, right? And so um, I also want to challenge people's notions of that because um, I will just say this matter of factly that. Sometimes white people don't think that maybe the only reason why they got hired was simply because they're white, right? Because if we think about fits and we think about institutional likeness, um, how things stay the same, maybe people just hired you not because of what your, your qualification or just simply just because you are a white person, right? And I think that's something really important to think about that usually folks don't think about when we start thinking about like hiring, and um, uh, especially when we start talking about like diversity and diversity in hires, right? Because this idea of diversity and quality candidates do not always go together, but no one ever thinks about the history of, uh, of exclusion through hiring practices because people would hire people that more likely are white, right? Or if you have a you know, non-angle sized name, you are less likely to get a job called back, right? So there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that go into this. Um, and then you know, as, as a committee member, if you're on a hiring committee, Maybe you just resonated more with that one candidate over the other. That also happens, right? Hiring is not really a, a, an objective thing, but we try to pretend that it is because everyone has their thoughts and feelings about what they want for that next hire. And you just decided that like, that's that person that you chose, that's who, that's who you wanted. I don't think it's wrong for you to have those, those, those ideas or understandings. Um, but I also think that like if an institution or a, a job wants to change things and they, they, they look around and everyone's white, well, the, the, we have a problem, right? If you want to diversify, you say that diversity is at your core and everyone is white, well, there's lots to work with, right? There's lots, there's a lot to think about. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat at the moment. Anybody want to raise a hand or just unmute yourself and speak up? I am Carolyn. I just wanted to see if anybody read the one of the editorials today in the paper um, about th that Biden hired the black woman to be in the Supreme Court. And this person went on a little rant about, you know, what about all those other qualified white men? And, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so ignorant. I mean, I was really upset about that, that, but I don't know. It's the same thing that you were just talking about is, and what Leah had brought up is, you know, we're making choices and this person is any less, not any less qualified than all those other people. So anyway, hopefully that will things. spark a bunch of, a bunch of editorials back from people. I hope so. <laughs> if anyone's looked at the candidates that are available to him, they're amazing. They're amazing women. 
And I just, I can't put my head around people like saying even, this isn't okay. I'm like, right. Like what you were saying, <laughs> Leah, I think these, these candidates, those black women have to, had to be vetted their whole entire lives. <laughs> yeah. And prove themselves way more than any white person. Um, so yeah, I think they're great candidates. <laughs> Uh, I think to the, to, 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 to the point is to add in, right? Like uh, no one had a problem when, uh, you know, majority of the Supreme Court justices have been white men, right? Like when she was <laughs> oh, white yeah, men, I did. You know, well, I mean, sure, there might be some, you know, obviously ruffled, but like no one thinks about that when it's like, it's a bunch of white men being, you know, being elected to be a Supreme Court justice. But then when it's a, usually a person of color, if it's a woman, it's like, whoa, you know, if we, if we put a woman on the justice, you know, Supreme Court justice, well, then we, we got to do something else, right? Or it, it becomes like this kind of like slippery slope logic. But then how come, you know, as, you know, a legislative body, no one really had these, these issues about all these men that came before, but as soon as we want to consider other people, it becomes an uh, issue. Other people that happen to be not white, uh, not, a, not a man, uh, it becomes like this big brouhaha, right? And so, um, again, the question becomes why? Are we truly an inclusive society or, you know, it makes you, it makes you wonder, right? Remember what uh, Ginsburg said when they asked her uh, how many women she wanted on the Supreme Court? Her reaction was nine. And everybody was shocked, which is, well, there have been nine men for years. <laughs> Nobody ever thought of that. I thought that was just, yeah. Or, or, or the idea that nine women couldn't be representative of America or, or you know, of the American yeah. Constitution or American justice. I mean, like, that's, isn't that, that's such a profound, I don't know why people would be bothered by that, but people are, right? Um, you know, so it, it's, I mean, what, what you're raising is, is, is a very great point. Um, and so I think, um, you know, so last thing I will also say, and I'm encouraging my students is to, to always keep asking why, right? Be like that two-year-old that's like, why, 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 right? <laughs> Never stop asking why, because when you start, when you continue to ask the why, you really get to the notions of, of the power relations or the power dynamics, um, you know, in this country or this organization or what people believe. Right, because if someone says something that's bigoted, well, why do you believe this, right? Like, and it's going to reveal so much. We do enough. We do a lot of the what, but we don't do enough of the why. So then, then why as a country are we upset if we want to have a black woman as supreme Supreme Court justice, or why would we be upset if we want to have nine women as Supreme Court justices? Why are we bothered by this? Why is it troubling? Right. Very good. Um, anybody else with a good question? Carolyn, I appreciate that last question because I was kind of trying to figure out how to phrase to get at that. And I hadn't seen that editorial, so their letter to the editor. So thanks for bringing that up. I think it was a great question. Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I just want to, uh, I want to thank our speaker. I mean, Amir, this has been really exciting. Uh, you've been you've been captivating. You've been inspiring, and um, uh, I, I do hope that we have a future uh, working together to uh, to try to put together some good programming to to as a platform uh, for these things that you you are uh, well versed in. So. Brandon, thank you for the connection, but we have Brandon here and uh, being our, our fearless leader uh, and connector to many great um, speakers at the university. Brandon, do you have anything or, or Amir, I guess I should ask, do you have anything you wanna say in closing? Whew. Um, I would say one, I, one, I wanna say, you know, thank you all for inviting me into this space and just to be here to have this dialogue. Uh, it's, it's good to know that there, I mean, there are people in Pullman that are thinking about these things or are concerned about things and want to do things, right? So it's a, it's a good thing. Um, and I, I just want to say like, you know, again, like just don't forget about the individual power that you have, that you hold, uh, but all, also don't forget about the collective power of, of us as a community and, you know, what, what we all can do, right? Because we all know people who also know other people, right? And so we could have conversations, we can do things on a you know, on a, on a bigger scale level, 
right? And so, um, you know, and again, I will just say, but everything looks discouraging now, um, but there are people that are doing that good work. So don't forget that you are also one of those people doing the work, right? So don't, don't, don't you know, discount, your, dis discount yourself from the work that you're doing. Uh, and that there will always be more work to, to be done, right? Um, obviously, you know, as a, the League of Women Voters, you know, you know that the history of women's rights in this country has always been something that has to, it's always, always being reminded and fought for and to the forefront, right? And so it's, it's not a one-time thing. And so the things that we are fighting for now are not one-time things either. And so we, we always have to be back at it, right? Um, um, so, yeah. And I, I will be happy to be back in this space or, um, you know, whatever, whatever need be. Um, I will be back as long as there's breath in my body, I, I will be back, so. Thank you, thank you so much. Brandon, do you have any closing remarks? Um, hey, like I said, it was pretty obvious to everybody that uh, that a mirror was was special and needed to be added to the faculty at, at the College of Education. So he, he has always impressed me and uh, once again tonight as well. So thank you, Amir, I appreciate it. And that's, uh, that's all I'll say. All right. Um, I have only a, another closing remark, and that is um, if you are interested in joining the League of Women Voters, uh, the, you can go on our website, lwv.org, and uh, sign up. We're, and if you're a student, that's even cooler. Your membership <laughs> is free. You might share that with, your, uh, with some of the people in your classes, uh, Amir, that it's free. And, and we, uh, we would welcome uh, having, that, ha having uh, students in our midst. We have a few, and uh, I just actually got another one, but I'd sure like to have more, so. All right, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, the recording will be available, maybe if I stick with it tonight, it might be available Monday, because I gotta give it over. Well, I don't know, Leah, maybe Leah can upload it really quickly. Is that right? Leah? Uh, you'd have to download it from Zoom and then give it to me unless you upload it to a, a cloud. So yeah, I'm gonna just, it's, it's recording on my, I'm gonna stop this. Okay. Uh, it's recording on my computer.